When we got up to Iwo Jima, all the big guns on the front part of the island there, they had knocked out. I mean, it had to be hand-to-hand -hand stuff from then on. And we was up there to lay those nets at the harbor. That's when we encountered the suicide planes. Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and real quick, before we get into our veteran story, I wanted to tell you about who we are and how you can help with this project. Memoirs of World War II is an organization run by myself and my family. We travel all over, interviewing the last living veterans of the Second World War and sharing their stories in this series to ensure that their service and this important history is never forgotten. We are funded by donations from people like you, both through Patreon, where you can choose what dollar amount you'd like to give, and through our website. So follow the links in the description below and you can be part of preserving this history. Thank you for your support and now on to our veteran story. I was with the 1939 Ford with Ed Allball and Rob Roy Walters. It was on a Sunday when we heard that they had attacked Pearl Harbor. Scary, it's scary. Following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, it seemed the whole of the United States was prepared to go to war. But Robert Denny of New Straitsville, Ohio, being too young to enlist, had no choice but to watch as nearly every young man from his hometown joined the armed forces. It's just a small town. I had a couple of friends that was taken out of the 11th grade. And uh, I didn't turn 18 until I got into my senior year. And uh, I went to uh, the draft board of Perry County. He said, we have our quota filled for now. We'll take you as soon as you graduate. That you and I stand on the state house steps. Immediately following graduation, Bob reported to Columbus, Ohio to enlist. At long last, he was joining the Navy. I went to Camp Perry, Virginia. I had my basic training down there. We had some training on guns. I was on 20 millimeter. And uh, after basic training, we was home for a few days, and then we went to San Francisco and boarded the ship that we was on was the USS Kickhot. And it was already loaded with the nets and that. It was a net layer ship that we laid invasion nets and that so they could lay out and shoot torpedoes and that in on it. So that was, it was already loaded and ready to go when we got on it. For the past two years, the U.S. Armed Forces had pursued the Japanese throughout the Pacific Theater, one fortified island at a time. Each battle was more brutal than the last and the Japanese resolve only grew in desperation as the Allies made their way west toward their enemy's homeland. As Bob deployed out to sea, he had no way of knowing he was sailing into the climax of the lethal conflict. We didn't know who we were on until we got out to sea a ways. And the first time that the general alarm sounded, they came to me and told me that I wasn't to go to the 20 millimeter, I was to go to the ammunition for the five inch. I didn't even know where it was, I'd never been there. And lo and behold, there was this little round hole that we went down in, and we was under a submarine attack. And I was never so scared in all my life. You could feel them dropping the death charges and shaking. And But the five inches was never fired. They dropped death charges and all that. They just got over with it, as far as I know. That was the Anna Weetalk that we had to sub attack at Anna Weetalk. And then we went on down to uh, 
Saipan, Guam, and then up to the Iwo Jima. When we got up to Iwo Jima, all the big guns on the front part of the island there, they had knocked out. I mean, it had to be hand-to-hand -hand stuff from then on. And we was up there to lay those nets at the harbor. And man, they were such an array of ships there that we were just in the road. Everything was going smoothly. And that's when we encountered the suicide planes. And I was downstairs when the general alarm was sounded. And I run and started back up the steps and just got to the top of the steps to step out on the main deck, and boom. We had a suicide plane that hit our ship. It hit right by the 40 millimeter in the uh, sick bay. And we had an epidemic of guys with mumps at the sick bay. And it killed all them, it killed our doctor. And I had just been relieved from my buddy, Jack Burton was his name. He relieved me and he was on the focal. And he was, he was probably 150 feet away from where the plane blew up, but he got killed. Bill Fisher, a friend of mine, lost a leg. And, and a lot of guys were burnt. Had an awful lot of injuries in that. And uh, by the sick bay and all the medical supplies and all that stuff being eradicated by the bomb going off, we had to find some place to put the wounded. And we put them in the mess hall on the tables. That was something that was hard to get over. It was just terrible going in the mess hall trying to eat and remembering things. And then, right, certainly right after that, I mean, we broke out of the convoy and they were sending us to a hospital ship that was right off of Mount Shiribachi. You could just, you could see fighting going on on this. We was right, the, the ship could have, the hospital ship could have been hit with small arms fire. You could just, See out of the corner of your eye what was going on on shore. After we got them unloaded and that, and, and somehow, some way, I don't know who, they done some repairs on the ship when we was in there. And we got back out to sea, and that's when I remember burying the dead in that. That, that, that the guy that was in the plane, we buried him the same as. We bury our guys. Following the Battle of Iwo Jima, the newly repaired USS Keokuk would continue to carry out its duties, laying nets at the next island invasion, the Battle of Okinawa. Though the deadliest yet, Okinawa would prove to be the final battle in the Pacific Theater. Soon after, the dropping of the atomic bombs would bring the Empire of Japan to its knees, and at long last, an end to the Second World War. Anyway, when we got back home, they greeted us at the harbor and made us welcome home. And then shortly after that, I got discharged. The cold strike was over, and I went back to the mine. That's when I was getting a dollar, five, five cents an hour. I had big money then. For nearly eight decades following Japan's surrender, Bob's memories of the Second World War remained with him, as vivid as ever. I never will forget going down that little hole to that five inch, where the five inch shells were. I was scary. But, yes, it's affected. You can be more appreciative. What 
what I seen when I went in service now, you didn't see this hallelujah that's going on now. That you didn't see the division. You just seen things to take place that had to take place to win the war. And that's what was happening. You didn't see that kind of stuff now that you see now. It's really disturbing to see what's going on now. To see. That's only been 70 some years ago. To see what happened then and what's happening now, what's went wrong? I'd say keep your freedom. That's the biggest thing, keep your freedom. everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you for watching this episode. Our goal is to capture as many World War II veteran stories as we can from all over the world, but we can't do it alone. If you'd like to help us in this mission, consider supporting us through Patreon and check out our website, memoirsofworldwar2.com, for more information. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Again, we want to thank you for your support, and thanks for watching.